So tonight's speakers are Professor Raul Espejo, who's joining us from Valencia. Welcome, Raul. And uh, Professor Peter Conkra, uh, Cochran, who's joining us from a slightly less exotic Suffolk. Um, but nonetheless, um, it is fairly exotic if you like the Far East. Uh, so that's good. Um, Raul, um, what can I say? Um, I don't really think, Raul, you need any introduction from, from the likes of me. Um, what Raul is going to talk to us about tonight is enterprise complexity model and the viable systems model. Um, and um, really, I think it's probably the far, far the best if Raul were to speak for himself rather than have me speak for him. Please uh, all use the chat facility to drop ideas and thoughts and, and, and things into as we go along. We'll come back and pick some questions. Um, when Raoul's finished after about 30 minutes, we will um, take one or two questions for clarification at that point, then we'll switch over to hear what Peter has to say. Um, and I, again, with a quick Q&A, we will then go on to see if we can synthesize some meaning out of the whole. So uh, without further ado, Raoul, I, I think it's best if you introduce yourself um, and we get stuck into the evening's proceedings. So thank you. Thank you, John, for the invitation. Uh, I'm glad to, to be with you and all the people who have decided to join us. Uh, basically, uh, I have to mention the main context of my uh, contribution today is uh, uh, the work I've done for a, huge, a very large number of years. Uh, initially through Cinco Limited at the Aston Science Park and afterwards uh, uh, through Cinco Research, which is still working. And uh, uh, now uh, in the last decade, I've been uh, working with the World Organization of Systems and Cybernetics. And that's uh, WASC, as you can see in, in your uh, screen. Now, the main purpose of uh, these two uh, contributions that I made to Cinco and to WASC uh, has been managing complexity. And I've been somehow uh, very much influenced by the work of Stafford Beer, which uh, in fact, it started uh, about 50 years back. You know, that's quite an extraordinary number of years. And uh, uh, that was the work we did together in Chile at the time of the cyber scene project. Mm -hmm. So, uh, that, that project uh, gave the basic direction for what I'm going to talk uh, about uh, today. It is uh, essentially, or it was at the time, essentially a work about uh, managing the complexity of the Chilean economy. And uh, uh, I can tell you that uh, we did a huge uh, uh, number of things, but uh, as perhaps many of you know, it, the outcome was not all that uh, good simply because we had a, a, a coup d'etat in 1973. So that uh, the main purpose and direction of that, uh, of that work is uh, something that uh, is still valid today. Uh, and much more today than it was in those years. Uh, I can tell you that uh, in those years, the viable system model was uh, something very, very new. Uh, Stafford had just been uh, writing a few papers about that. And uh, uh, the book, uh, The Brain of the Firm was coming in 1972. And uh, therefore, it was very much uh, an unknown uh, model. So uh, that was the, uh, the beginning of, the, of, of, uh, of that work. And the viable system model, in effect, what uh, it wanted to do was to help uh, the agenda's government with uh, 
uh, systemic and cybernetic thinking in the management of the economy. And that's uh, something that uh, has uh, continued over the years. Uh, what was interesting is that, uh, as I can see it with hindsight today, I can recognize that the, we didn't really have the, the right technology to make it work in those years. One of the key uh, aspects of that model is uh, what we would consider heterarchical organizations. So horizontal organizations so that uh, had the ability to support themselves through coordination of the actions of the people involved. Now, in those days, that coordination was uh, limited by very primitive technology. In fact, many times people are uh, concerned that we didn't have computers. In my view, uh, really the key problem we had in those days was that we didn't have uh, enough uh, interactions in a horizontal sense. So the coordination of actions that we had couldn't really happen through uh, telex machines as we uh, did uh, quite a lot, but not enough to make uh, the whole system work. And as time has gone by, you can see that today, these uh, technology to support the coordination of actions uh, is extraordinarily developed to the point that today we need to work out far more how to handle these horizontal interactions. And we need to understand far more uh, how to uh, support uh, the coordination, the coordination of actions in a constructive and positive way for the development of organizations. Uh, uh, I would say that that is uh, the area that uh, today in the 2021, we still need to do a, a good deal. We still need to understand better how to uh, support uh, uh, different uh, people and different uh, organizations to interact with each other so that the coordination of their actions could support uh, general purposes and general interests of uh, today's world. We are suffering uh, these days extraordinary problems with uh, COVID-19 and also with all the problems of uh, uh, supporting it with internet uh, climate change uh, and making possible changes in the way in, uh, in which we handle very complex problems. Uh, we are in that and often we fail in managing that as we have seen today with COVID-19 it is uh, to me very clear that uh, this uh, need to have a, a worldwide uh, support for uh, people to uh, receive the vaccines and to coordinate uh, their activities uh, is still very primitive. So we can see that uh, COVID-19 is very well supported in uh, rich countries but not, uh, uh, so, uh, not so well in the poor countries of the world. And this global coordination, so that we would allow uh, not only uh, countries uh, like the United Kingdom or the United States to uh, support their, work, their activities through vaccination, it, this has to go through the African countries uh, and all the rest of the world. And that, that problem of managing the complexity of uh, these uh, issues uh, is I think one that is uh, very much uh, in our hands and uh, we, it needs to, to be supported by tools 
like the viable system model. And that I, I want to show a few things about that. The viable system model is not an analogy as many people tend to, to think about. It is not a, an analogy of a scientific situation uh, like the uh, human nervous system and managerial, a managerial situation like uh, the uh, organization of uh, companies or enterprises. Uh, it is certainly not. That's not what uh, uh, Stanford uh, offered to us. And that's where we need to, to, to understand that uh, what the viable system model is, in my view, and as proposed by Stafford in a couple of publications, is a scientific model. It's a model that recognizes these two worlds, the scientific situation and the managerial situation, and through processes of uh, uh, simplification, uh, goes uh, go through and perception, they are to conceptual models, and these conceptual models support homomorphisms between the scientific situation and the managerial situation, which then, uh, and that was the contribution of Stafford, uh, through uh, rigorous formulation, through isomorphisms, generate the inter generate the managerial and scientific situations in, in supported by the same model. And this generalization is what we recognize as the scientific model or the viable system model. It's not at all an analogy. And when people tend to think that the, the viable system model is an analogy of the nervous system, I think they have not understood what uh, the, uh, the methodology. The yo-yo methodology, you can see there in the center of the diagram, you can see the yo-yo methodology, which is the, uh, his uh, account of uh, scientific modeling. So go, going from very uh, different uh, situations and through processes of homomorphism and isomorphism, through processes of analogy and isomorphism generate a scientific model. So that's uh, where I, I want to start uh, this conversation. And what I want to, to, to do now is uh, to recognize the epistemological and methodological grounding of this model, because that's where I believe uh, something very significant can be, do can be done. Uh, the, in epistemological terms, I would suggest the fallacy of the black box descriptions uh, of, a, of, of an enterprise, uh, if, if we see an enterprise as a black box, the policy of these descriptions, black box descriptions, uh, uh, the uh, system, uh, and it responds to the system is refer to first all the cybernetics, all the cybernetics of the observed system. So in a, in a way, uh, to uh, understand enterprises and as input-output uh, systems is uh, one particular view, uh, which I recognize is the black box view. However, uh, that is only one. The most, uh, in my view, the most powerful and interesting description is what I call the operational descriptions and they are focused on relationships producing this organizational system. Uh, these are uh, subject to subject reflexive relationships constructing the system. Uh, the focus 
is not on an external observer looking at an enterprise as an input output, but the focus is that there are people in interaction subject to subject. It, might, it could be group to group and so on. And these uh, reflexive uh, relationships are constructing the system. This uh, description is often referred to as second order cybernetics or the cybernetics of observing systems. Perhaps the point to make here is that black box and operational descriptions are complementary. So when I hear people saying that the, the, the black that the viral system model is a model of a, as a, an enterprise as a, as a black box, or it is a, a strictly uh, as a, a, a model of uh, people in interaction, I think they are missing some of the value of uh, these, uh, these models. I can say to you that black box and operational descriptions are complementary in the creation, regulation, and production of viable systems, are complementary. Therefore, this approach, uh, the approach I use to study and design organizations is not one, neither one nor the other. It is the, as I will show you in a minute, it is the connection between these two forms of description. What uh, it perhaps is uh, interesting is the, what is the value that each of them contribute to the overall understanding of uh, organizations, of enterprises, and to the management of complexity of the problem situations in our society today. The management of aspects so intractable as COVID-19. Uh, so that's uh, what I, I, I will start showing you is something that uh, you can see in uh, in Stafford's uh, brain uh, heart of enterprise in 1979 page 47 you he shows this diagram that I'm going to uh, explain in a few words and see what's the interest that it offers to us for studying enterprises. So what uh, he shows there is that uh, a, a black box with eight inputs and one output uh, has in fact uh, an extraordinary complexity. The variety can that uh, this simple black box can generate is something that goes to two to the power of 256. So if we have eight inputs with uh, each of them with the zero one values for these inputs and one output with zero one as well, we have the variety, the number of possible states of the output is two, the number of possible states of the input is 256, and the variety of the black box is two to the power of two, uh, 256. This is a huge, huge variety. So if our uh, purpose as uh, uh, people trying to regulate and manage situations in the in the world in which we operate is to manage the complexity of the black boxes, then clearly we will be overpassed by whatever is the case. Mm -hmm. Hugely overpassed. So in, in effect, one of the things we learn very quickly is to learn how to reduce the, that complexity, uh, but often we do that without understanding, without having systemic sensibility. But the, the, most of the time, we, what we do is we 
fragment this black box and we will see that by fragmentation we move very quickly from those large numbers that I, I have shown you there to much more manageable numbers uh, as we move uh, through the processes of fragmentation. But when the overall situation is one that lacks systemic sensibility and the fragmentation that we do of the black box is uh, eight boxes uh, with one input and one output alone, what we have done is we have lost the richness of the interactions between these uh, parts and therefore trans transformed something that was highly complex, highly cha chaotic, uh, when simply everything can connect with everything else, we have transformed them into a, a simplistic uh, black boxes of one input and one output. So uh, what we do in general is we uh, divide, we, we divide the black box uh, to make it more manageable. And that is perhaps one of the key aspects of systemic thinking. Systemic recognition of constraint is really the challenge that we have with this black box. And that is splitting the black box in this example that I'm giving uh, in two, each with four inputs and uh, one output. And that is uh, simply uh, adding, if we, what we do is uh, uh, dividing, constraining the black box into two, two uh, black boxes, each of them with one, uh, with four inputs and one output, then the variety of the situation moves to two to the power of 17. So just that simple, constraining uh, has made the whole situation manageable. But as, as we, uh, as I have just mentioned, if we uh, go into fragmentation, which is the typical situation that happens in our world, uh, in our world of, of businesses and organizations, in that case, we may get very, very limited, very small variety, and that is something that is not going to uh, be very helpful in terms of understanding connectivity and, uh, and managing the complexity. So the real interesting point uh, that I could see with the viral system model was how to recognize constraint. How to recognize constraint so that uh, in fact, we could divide the chaotic world in which we operate into subsystems that have a high degree of autonomy and at the same time are very much interconnected with the others so that together they can generate a response capacity to the situation that was originally presented by the, the original black box. So uh, th that process is what uh, I developed uh, in, the, in the form of, uh, uh, sorry, I think, uh, the, the constraining that uh, I'm talking about is precisely transforming the total situation into a system that has uh, subsystems, autonomous subsystems, and this autonomous subsystem. And that's what you, uh, you have seen as the idea of unfolding of complexity, or basically the idea of recursion that Stafford proposed. That uh, issue of uh, constraining uh, and, uh, uh, and creating autonomous units that at the same time of being autonomous are part of the totality 
is something that uh, I, I can show you in this diagram about the strategic business unit uh, of uh, one of the companies that Sinclair worked with. And that is uh, uh, where you have six products in one strategic business unit and two plans. And what we see there is that the constraining uh, is uh, dividing uh, the, uh, these uh, total pro uh, products into six, and the, the, we, which we call the market segments. And these market segments and, and the plants into production lines. And then together, we bring them together into something that uh, here is called uh, uh, an autonomous unit, the market segment one, with percentages of the production lines uh, of each of the, of the plant in percentual production line X, Y, and Z. And so you can see how by building up the constraint in this very, very large complexity of the situation, we start to make it manageable. And attached to each of these units, we have, uh, we have a, a autonomy and we have a managerial capacity. Uh, However, the interesting part of, uh, uh, of, uh, of all this uh, unfolding is that uh, it, I, I developed uh, something that, uh, was, uh, uh, that, that was the Y-Plan method. And the Y-Plan method, uh, which uh, came as uh, an earlier contribution from my side, what it uh, attempted to do was to produce precisely this constraining of the main transformation of a particular enterprise. So if you have an enterprise with inputs and outputs, uh, what happens, what normally happens there is that people are trying to think about how is it that these inputs are transformed into outputs. And the transformation is precisely what we need to understand how to uh, constrained uh, so that rather than taking all the possibilities of inputs and outputs, we just focus on those that have more potentials for autonomy. And uh, uh, through the Y-Plan method, what I did was to generate a particular way of uh, thinking about these constraining, so that uh, we had the marketing factors to constrain the transformation. We had the technological factors to constrain the transformation. We have temporal factors constraining the transformation and so on. So uh, once we had the, the situation, the enterprise, uh, based on, uh, on these ideas of uh, constraining uh, them, we could start to think about each of the, the, the enterprise and each of the units as autonomous units with a need for uh, interacting effectively with the environment. And that is uh, the idea of the, uh, of the, of the, of the uh, relationships. The second, the second form of uh, is representing or thinking about the organizational system. So I started saying black box uh, the representation and operational description and the, the, the VSM operational description is focused on relationships. It starts from the beginning uh, with the idea of uh, performance, productivity and latency. So what we have is the total enterprise uh, interacting with an operational environment. And uh, in this operational environment, what we have uh, is the relationship of performance. And this performance uh, depends on how productive it, are the uh, units doing what the organization is supposed to do and how, uh, how strong are the potentials 
of the of the of the global organization in relation to the problematic environment, and that is, if, if you may remember or may recognize that these are the indices of performance as proposed by Stafford in the Chilean work. So this has 50 years of history. But in addition to the relationships of performance, productivity, and latency, we have the, the, the relationships of cohesion. And this relation of cohesion has to be considered as a totality, not as something that relates to uh, uh, resources bargaining alone in between the total enterprise and the uh, systems, but uh, the autonomous systems within it that uh, has to connect, to, uh, connect auditing and coordination. The very thing that I started mentioning at the beginning, uh, the coordination is something that uh, we together with auditing in the relationship between those who are managing the total organization and the autonomous units that are producing what the organization is all about. And this is in the relationship to about five minutes now. Right. And then and then we have all the uh, other relationships here, which uh, uh, certainly I don't have time to, to explain, and therefore I would just pass them by. However, <coughs> I think the, the VSM uh, in, in my personal work uh, support, has been supported by the Viplan method and the methodology uh, in the direction of developing the enterprise complexity model, and the, which is visualized as an integrated distributed governance of an ecological ecology of evolving enterprise, guiding an enterprise collective self-organization. So the, the, the basic idea of uh, a, an enterprise complexity model is to, uh, manage complexity following what I have described before and developing a methodology to support the interactions of the enterprise with its environment. The challenge is self-organization towards more global values and policies creating, regulating and producing products and services that have been necessary to handle societal problems like COVID-19, climate change, and in general global ecological and economic situation. So uh, an enterprise complexity model is an enterprise's strategy to manage relevant complexity in a highly dynamic niche market. It requires an ongoing reconfiguration of resources, communications, or relationships to produce a responsive organizational system to handle problem situations such as those, such as those that go beyond particular enterprises. So the, the enterprise complexity model is going beyond the modeling of one enterprise. It is offering a way of modeling the total a, a, a one enterprise and all its uh, supporting uh, enterprises. And this is uh, essentially what the biplan methodology offers. What we have in the biplan methodology is uh, two loops. The, the internal loop with the black uh, colors is the cybernetic inner loop improving the system for the enterprise. And in this loop, what we have is big data, which is the characteristic of today's over, overloading that we have with data, uh, big, big data of enterprise actors and sustain and, and, and the big data of uh, required for a sustainable environment. And from there, what we do is we name 
the, enterprise, the enterprise in focus, and we name the problematic situation like COVID-19, for instance. And what happens next is that within the inner loop there, we have uh, the diagnose, diagnosing the enterprises organization structure through the Viplan method I already explained, and it, it, trying to improve the cybernetics of the enterprise in the environment. So this loop's purpose is to improve the cybernetics of that enterprise uh, in, in, in its uh, uh, environment. At, at the same time, what we have in the outer loop there, with the white uh, part of the di diagram, what you have is problem situations, environmental ecology, COVID-19, X-ray, and these are very much modeled by enterprise complexity models or organizational systems or liquid enterprises performance in, in sustainable development goals. So this is then related to enterprise complexity model interaction, self-organization and correcting variety imbalances. So, and that in, the, in a way tries to improve the situation as, as far as possible. However, what is interesting is that these two loops are reflexively interconnected. As uh, the problem situation generates the need for more uh, enterprises, for more resources, for more uh, communications and interactions, that Im implies the need to change the, or the, the organization in focus. And then we are changing the, the enterprise in directions that move that move uh, towards improving the situation. And as we improve the, uh, the organization structure of the enterprise in focus, then we are changing the conditions for the problem situation. And that is leading to changes in interactions and leading to changes in the overall management of the organization. And that is, uh, what I would say here, uh, it, it, this reflexive part is what allows this to be a learning, a learning process that uh, it improves the situation uh, in a reflexive manner. So since uh, the time is, uh, is, is not uh, uh, available, uh, I will simply read very quickly an enterprise complexity model is a structural strategy to close the complexity gap between elite enterprise and its environment through reconfiguring resources, relationships, and interaction. These are the dynamic capabilities. This structure enables, enables clusters of resources to align their interactions and, uh, and, and produce, for instance, for uh, COVID-19, the possibility to relate a national health service to the hundreds of thousands of enterprises which uh, allow them uh, that to happen. And then uh, uh, as the enterprise complexity model unfolds, we need to, to observe how technologies alter communications between environmental engines and organizational acts. Uh, basically, a current enterprise has actualities, capabilities, and potentialities, but its uh, latencies uh, allows them to, to produce and give. And this is what I would propose as, a propo uh, as something that can be uh, used to manage complexity of a, an original uh, enterprise like the National Health Service with a, a global a requirement of society as it is the health problems of society in, in totality. And that's essentially what uh, the enterprise complexity model is all about. This in a way has been uh, developed uh, to a certain degree in the book, Organizational Systems, Managing Complexity with a Viable System Model. And that's it. Thank you very much.
Wow, thank you. Um, it's really nice to sit here and, and um, having been working with, with uh, BSM for 30 years, um, to, to hear somebody else talk about it and, 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 uh, and recognize so much and, and maybe want to argue with one or two bits, but that's, that's the nature of these things. Um, Margaret Heath has asked us, um, or asked you rather, um, are your channels the relationships of connection between various system functions? So there's a sort of question for clarity really there. Raoul, if you wouldn't mind. Sorry, they, they, they are asking for relations between the functions. Yeah. No, I'm asking, sorry, I'm, I went to the dentist, so I'm speaking a bit strangely. Um, I'm asking whether you've actually replaced the channels with these relationships. Yeah. What, uh, I haven't replaced the channels with these relationships, but I have, uh, main, uh, what I am offering there is a, a, a description of key relationships, like relationships of trust, relationships of collaboration, ah, relationships you're of abstracting it mm -hmm. more uh, more the more emotional aspects of inter, of engagement not only more emotional but there are the, the the ways in which relationships build up together in organizations nice. and that's nice. uh, something that requires the capacity mm. channels that you are asking for that's so really following lovely that, following that thread Raul, um do you think the politics of 2021 are any more sympathetic to the notion of uh, highly distributed power that the VSM in, in its glory um, demands, if, it, if it's going to be followed, or are we still facing a sort of a, a centralizing process which makes it very difficult, um, both commercially and politically? Well, I, I do think that uh, centralization is still very much there. So the, the, uh, until we, we Transform, but that's precisely why I think the understanding of relationships is crucial. Because if you understand the viable system as a list of functions, uh, you are never going to transmit the power of uh, these relationships to people who need them badly. So, uh, as I'm aware of, I think uh, today clearly. Uh, hierarchies still dominate what uh, we, we are doing in enterprises. However, we do have the tools. We have the tools that uh, would help us to improve the quality of these uh, relationships. And, uh, and, and that is something that indeed I didn't have time to reflect upon, but ideas of the requisite variety and residual variety, which are crucial to my own work, uh, are uh, aspects that need to be brought in so that people start to understand better how to uh, manage this complexity that they are dealing with, with uh, uh, the support of uh, uh, the enterprise complexity model. That's brilliant and, and gives me a perfect link. So we'll, we'll move on to talk to, to, to get Peter Cochran to talk to us uh, very shortly. Um, um, and we'll, we'll come back and then enrich the conversation later on by, by trying to link these two threads of conversation um, in, into some sort of synthesis towards the end. Because Peter's, uh, Peter's title tonight is Truth, Situation and Context Awareness. And of course, the, the thread there is the complexity of the situation and understanding or generating the validity of, of our understanding. Um, and particularly he says, in a cyber world, this is orders of magnitude more difficult than the disconnected past. And actually, I think, Raoul, you were just really talking about the disconnected present in, in, in some respects. So, uh, Peter, if I hand over to you and allow you to, to, to share, you should be able to share um, by pushing the share screen button with a bit of luck. Let me just bring this up. Introduce yourself, if you wouldn't mind, and, uh, and, and uh, off you go. You've got 30 minutes. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and I'm trying to be too clever. I'm using two screens at the same time, and that, that didn't go too well. Just a moment. Let me, uh, let me come down onto this screen. Now, uh, let's see. If, I, if this doesn't work this time, I'll re revert to one screen. I'm going to revert to one screen. Just stand by. Okay. We've got some good questions carrying on into the into the thread here, Peter, while you're puffing about. So. 
Peter, we can see the slide. Oh. What is it you're trying to do, Peter? Well, um, <clears throat> I've got um, a, a different kind of presentation and uh, it helps if I can see uh, two modes at once. Just a second. Resume sharing. All right. Uh, this should now work well. Stand by. Uh, okay. You should see my uh, opening slide, truth, situation, context, awareness. Do you get that? Yep. All right. Now, at, at some point, um, about three slides in, there'll be uh, movies running. Uh, if you don't see movies, let me know, uh, because they, uh, they should be... Uh, 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 very clear indeed. Okay, so let's get underway. Um, this is an ongoing program. I have two PhD students working on this, uh, both who works with GCHQ. Uh, both have come with different uh, talents and capabilities, one with deep technical capability, another one with deep uh, psychological and uh, human relationships. And I, I need a, at least a, a third uh, problem to, uh, a third student to uh, make a success of this project. But what I'm gonna do is relate to you um, this problem, and I'm gonna do it through using a, a dramatization of a, a situation. So here, here's the key decision tool of the human race, the kneecap. Um, the majority of human decisions are, are very reactive. Uh, they're not with any real deep thought. A good example would be driving your car. Um, I find that I can arrive at work with no really deep recollection of the journey between my home uh, and office. Um, I instinctively drive my car. And, um, it, but for a, a lot of problems, um, there are many more in, uh, unknown parameters. And I watch senior managers in company making uh, knee-jerk reactions when in actual fact, they are neglecting a vast number of parameters that are really important, and it's quite chilling. So here's the number one question, um, and, and here are the answers. So that, that's the, uh, the tenet for the whole presentation. Um, the complexity that I'm going to delve into um, is not just combinatorial, it's stochastic, that is. Uh, the conditions of the uh, uh, combinations is changing all the time. The probabilities are dynamic. Um, and this is what uh, we're facing on my side of the house. So um, if we can uh, get this to work, we might avoid uh, some uh, uh, really uh, nasty situations. So. This is the uh, dramatization of a real event, and um, it's uh, put in the context of a submarine where it was actually um, a, a warship, a surface ship. And uh, what uh, is happening here, uh, Captain Ramis is planning to defect. Uh, and the subplot uh, in, in this uh, Tom Clancy novel is that uh, he lost his wife due to medical negligence. And this was covered up by the party. And so he's a, a little bit bitter. Uh, he has uh, no surviving relatives. He has uh, convinced his officers to go with him uh, to try and donate this uh, flagship submarine uh, to the Americans. Uh, to do that, he's got to get rid of his crew, uh, the political officer, and a few little difficulties like that. So only Ramius knows the truth, the situation and the context of this. So these two are in collusion. And um, what Ramis has done is uh, spilled uh, the beans. He's told the Kremlin exactly what he's doing, only they have not received the message yet. So um, he's uh, set about uh, 
putting breadcrumbs of confusion down. So um, on the other side of the Atlantic, uh, this is Jack Ryan, analyst, uh, ex-military. Uh, he has uh, been tasked with uh, briefing the Pentagon. Gentlemen, the last 24 hours have seen some extraordinary Soviet naval activity. The first sail was this ship, we believe called the Red October, in reference to the October Revolution of 1917. A variant of the Typhoon class, she's some 650 feet long and 32,000 tons submerged displacement, roughly the same size as a World War II aircraft carrier. Uh, it is designed to approach by stealth and to shower its target with multiple independent warheads with little or no warning before impact. There are now some 58 nuclear submarines headed at high speed into the Atlantic. This afternoon, satellite pass over Poliarni found heat blooms in the engineering plans of the Kirov, the Minsk, and more than 20 other cruisers and destroyers indicating they were preparing to sail. This constitutes the bulk of the Soviet surface fleet. I have not read your conclusions. Sir, the data support no conclusions as yet. The absence of activity in the Pacific suggests this could be just an exercise. So this is the situation, if you like, overview that the Pentagon uh, are looking at. Um, they have got a good uh, handle on the situation. Uh, they know uh, all of this is true, but they have no context. So they have an incomplete set of data on which to base any judgment call. So this is the Russian uh, um, ambassador sitting with the American ambassador. And uh, his story is uh, really interesting. He has received uh, the full details from Ramius, but this is how he presents it to the Americans. Oh. Apparently, he has suffered a kind of breakdown in which he announced his intention to deploy his missiles on the United States. He wants to help you hunt him down. So, the Russian ambassador is um, uh, telling, uh, he knows what the truth is, but he's telling lies. And um, he knows the context, but he does not know the situation. Um, in contrast, the American ambassador uh, has a suspicion uh, of uh, what the truth might be. He knows the situation, but doesn't know what the context is. But this is again Jack Ryan, who stumbles across uh, the actual context. Ramius might be trying to defect. Do you mean to suggest that this man has Proceed, come... Mr. Ryan. Well, Remy has trained most of their officer corps, which will put him in a position to select men willing to help him. And he's not Russian. He's Lithuanian by birth, raised by his paternal grandfather, a fisherman. He has no children, no ties to leave behind. And today is the first anniversary of his wife's death. Oh, come on. You're just an analyst. What can you possibly know what goes on in this mine? I know Ramius, General. He's nearly a legend in the submarine community. He's been a maverick his entire career. I actually met him once at an embassy dinner. Have you ever met Captain Ramius, General? So, Jack has stumbled on the context. And uh, he understands the uh, truth. He's not quite sure about the situation because the exact location of the Red October is not known. Uh, and the setting uh, to see of the entire Russian fleet to track down and destroy this boat um, looks like a friendly act, but it turns out not to be. So these are the sort of hidden variables in the background. And um, in complete contrast, uh, this is a hunter-killer submarine, mid-Atlantic, who stumbled across the Red October 
And this is the reaction. Open the outer doors, firing point procedures. We sail into history. I'm going to Mars. That American captain only cares about one thing. He's got a submarine in front of him. It belongs to the enemy. It's got uh, torpedo tubes loaded. He doesn't know what the truth is. He doesn't know what the context is. But his number one responsibility is to save his boat, save his crew, and protect the United States. He wants to press the button. So far, there are 15 recorded near misses of a nuclear conflagration that have been averted because somebody has actually said, just a minute, before we press the button, let's just think about this. This might not be what we think it is. So in my view, we arrive here today, not by design, but by an extraordinary run of good luck. And sooner or later, either a human or a machine mistake, or a madman, if you will, is likely to see some uh, uh, global carnage. And uh, the likelihood of a catastrophe accelerates as the complexity uh, grows. So here is my view of the theater of war now. Uh, it's escalated from just land, sea, and air uh, to space, cyber and uh, on to uh, information. It is, um, let me, I've got, um, we now got um, the bias of uh, a population being manipulated by the enemy uh, through the very media, media that we own. Here's what I mean. We could trigger any form of conventional nuclear or information war, biochemical war, through uh, the media by just convincing people. Uh, Putin uh, has got a battle plan, by the way, uh, that avows to use this tool uh, to get populations in his sights to the point where they can't make any sensible decisions. And it seems to be working. So there's only war, uh, every domain is interconnected and governments can no longer defend their populations and have not been able to do with some time. So here's a, a sort of network. This is the sort of thing that we brought up on as students, only it's not like that anymore. It's like this. And worse, uh, the condition of each of the nodes is changing dynamically as well. We have no mathematics, no models, and no way of understanding this. It is way beyond a human mind or a collection of human minds. So that, that's the, uh, the, the big challenge. And uh, the, the good news is um, we do have some tools that we can throw at this problem, but the reality is the speed of change is way beyond human capabilities. So well, here's uh, my model. Um, situation awareness, context awareness, and truth. Um, the snag is that throughout an organization, um, in as changing parameters, it's oscillating with various degrees of truth, situation, and context information. Um, this is not static, it, it keeps changing. And people are not fast enough in their communication to deal with it. And so this uh, makes it rather tricky. So what we've done so far is to build a partially automated truth engine that works really very well. Uh, the bits that need automating um, are quite uh, extensive, uh, but I've not been able to get um, uh, funding for this uh, as yet. So. We've got uh, truth, uh, in my view, uh, sewn up uh, from this point of view. Situation awareness, well, you can buy military systems or industrial systems. Everybody's got situation awareness. Uh, that is also a, <coughs> a, done, a done deal, excuse me. 
So let me now coin this uh, in uh, the world of COVID. What went fundamentally wrong? Basically, we've got uh, political class uh, educated in the classics, do not understand complexity, do not understand exponential functions. They have just about learnt um, what it all means. And if we were to start again, they would make uh, much better um, and direct um, judgment calls uh, and decisions. Um, it, it's been quite fascinating to watch uh, the scientists trying to educate them to what an exponential function is. And uh, if you look back over the history of COVID, there were some pretty terrible mistakes. However, here we are. So here's uh, just a sample for you, because that's all I've got time for, of behavioral analysis of a uh, network attack. No matter what kind of attack, whether it be land, sea, air, um, conventional forces, or uh, cyber attack, there are always precursors if you know where to look for them. So this was a rather large attack um, on uh, uh, Canada. It came through various networks, uh, various botnets, and you'll see uh, between numbers uh, three and two, a rather large blip, which is a, a, a precursor to the, the big uh, attack. What we don't understand, what this other group were doing underneath. I, I have no idea. All we know is there was a second group involved in this attack and uh, they were more or less shadowing uh, what, what was happening. But uh, there's no clear explanation. Of it. So this is the sort of level of infancy that we're in, but it's what we can uh, actually gather. So let me give you a little bit more uh, behavioral analysis. Here's a network, top right, normal daily operation. Here's an abnormal behavior in the network that should ring alarm bells. This is ignored at the moment. Uh, top left is a Wi-Fi signal. That's not stable. Somebody's doing something there. One, that's not detected. Two, nobody does anything about it. And at the bottom, we've got uh, Snowden, who right under the noses of his uh, co-workers lifted many gigabytes of information and uh, got it out of the building. Now, all of these things can be detected and can be automated, and, and that's what we, uh, we, we need to do. So that is part of the, the context engine, if you will. So the, the key observation is, it's not just people that are habitual, but their devices, the, the nets are, are also uh, habitual, and any deviation from habitual behaviors should ring an alarm bell and focus our uh, attention. So uh, we got a, a solution and um, we, we're going to have to make some choices uh, because in implementing uh, the solution, we personally will be giving up some of our privacy and uh, some of our, if you wish, freedom. Uh, but the uh, other alternative is we are going to see the world go under. We may or may not be aware but the cybercrime um, industry now is uh, uh, has a turnover money-wise um, that's about two-thirds of the GDP of the UK. Um, it could be a member of the G8. It is so big. And we're doing very little to defend ourselves uh, apart from filling the hole after the event. So um, the key thing with the model is it has to run continuously and dynamically compute the probabilities. It's not a one shot, uh, it's not instantaneous, and it's not a narrow problem. So uh, my key observation here is that there are absolutely no simple solutions, uh, sorry, no simple solutions to singly uh, simple problems, uh, sorry, to singular uh, complex uh, problems. It, it, it just, they just don't exist. Um, so our challenge is to find the patterns. And our friend in that context is AI. If AI has got a single property that we really need is its ability uh, to identify the patterns that we, we don't see.
So this is uh, a, a slight problem uh, in that human beings write the AI and then the AI becomes uh, cognitively biased. And uh, that is a challenge for a, a separate lecture in itself, but uh, that is, is quite a big uh, problem. So um, just to put a little bit more flesh on, on the bone, um, I marvel at the simple-minded thinking of the Green Party and its followers, who seem to think that if we stop polluting the planet, uh, if we um, somehow uh, reverse the rise in temperature, uh, we are going to go back to some uh, 1950s kind of climate, uh, climate. There is not a hope of doing that. We, as a species on this planet, are heading from, for some new stability point, and we don't know what that is. And this stability point could see large swathes of the United States uninhabitable due to the temperature rise. It could see uh, a subtropical uh, UK, and uh, population migration could be uh, the biggest threat to us uh, and not uh, a war. So uh, this is... Uh, something that I have no clue what to do about. But if people uh, are stupid or, or make a mistake, uh, that's very, very hard uh, to uh, actually take care of. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your attention. This slide is available on my homepage, uh, petercochran.com. You're welcome to download it. And um, I hope you found that uh, interesting. Always good to have a pause when you finish speaking, Peter, um, and let your brain catch up, or let my brain catch up anyway, with the things that I've been listening to for, for the previous 20 minutes. Um, so, um, oh, Dave, we'll come straight in with David Dewhurst. You've, you've put a comment in the chat, David. So, do you want to, to, to say that out loud? You're on mute. If you want to unshare, Peter, because um, we'll we'll share the slides with everybody um, after the event. Yeah, let me uh, let me uh, do that. So everybody um, will, will. Sorry, I'm. <laughs> oh, I you're think back. I'm back. Good. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I, it's kind of traditional um, response, uh, Peter. You're saying, you know, we've got to. You're implying we've got to accept more controls and surveillance on ourself, uh, ourselves by our governments or uh, hierarchical organizations in order to defend ourselves from uh, the evil autocratic um, regimes abroad. And in terms of managing complexity and so on, uh, I wonder whether we're not uh, virtually driving ourselves to the um, same position one way or another. Now, could we in one bound be free? I think um, you say there are no simple singular solutions to complex problems. One of my problems with the theory of requisite variety is it understates the capacity of a bullet to reduce a variety of a very complex um, organization. Uh, Arguably, it underrates the capacity of a particular value system permeated uh, throughout the nomenclatures of various uh, regimes around the world to influence their behaviour. I would argue that the um, uh, in theory of games and economic behaviour, their tendency to reduce everything at the end of each chapter to um, a kind of... Uh, where there's a win-win perspective to say, hey, let's take, take, take the gains and reduce it to a zero-sum perspective is part of um, what is doing ourselves in. And we uh, need to develop um, a kind of understanding um, dialogue, much as we do with um, disturbed children or um, psychiatric um, patients with one another, um, as nations 
Well, you know, no doubt making sure that we are sort of moderately well backed up as well. But the sort of we have a capacity for conflict, we have a capacity for cooperation and arguably our capacity for cooperation has enabled us to ethnically cleanse all the other proto-humans on this planet. So um, surely there um, is a way through. We just need to find a better ideology than the current religions that uh, we've had, for example. And I'm minded of these at least temporary solution in Sol Solaris when they were about to uh, be bombed uh, of teach the intelligent bomb phenomenology, introduce a little bit of self-doubt, uh, the idea of optimization on one single function, which guys like Putin and not only Putin uh, tend to go for, isn't actually uh, that valid. So possibly, possibly, we're not as screwed up as you seem to be um, implying. Let, let, me, uh, let, me, let me give you uh, some examples of the corner that we've got into, okay? Um, not only can you not design one of these, nor can any other human. This is designed by AI. No human can put these together. It's put together by robots. Mm. We're totally dependent on this. Now, what is really interesting uh, is we have achieved our green economy by exporting all of the uh, pollution to China. So we have uh, Southeast Asia, is now making all of these and all our batteries. Uh, and so what we've done uh, in, uh, and by the way, we're the only species that optimizes. Mother Nature optimizes nothing and thereby achieves great resilience. And we optimize things and thereby introduce great brittleness and uh, in our systems. So you only have to look at um, the difference between uh, Mercedes E-Class and an F1 racing car to see that correlation. So, um, we, we uh, are dependent on things that are extremely vulnerable. Um, I'm not going to advertise what I would do as, if I was a terrorist, but I wouldn't go in around killing people. That's absolutely the wrong approach. Um, but fortunately, the terrorists uh, are not very well educated, and, and long way may, may it be that way. And so um, it, it, it is, um, I think, beholden on us to look at where we've got to and, and say, how are we going to move in, into the future? So without AI, uh, we will not survive. It may be that um, quantum computing will also fall into that category if we can get it to work. Mm. Um, and uh, we just don't know, uh, but we've got a tremendous record of uh, sort of digging ourselves out of uh, holes that we've built a uh, or Doug. Um, and um, with every technological revolution, the upside is far, far greater than, than the downside. You know, so it doesn't matter which technology you pick. You, you cannot think of a time in history when life was better than it is now, period. You know, people uh, have got better food, better clothing, better housing, better education should they, they choose to avail themselves of it. Um, but on, on the downside, um, we pay a price. Um, you know, the, I, I'll give you an example. Um, I was in a conversation online with some uh, uh, people uh, the other night. And uh, within about 15 minutes of this conversation, I was getting offers of the items we discussed from, uh, uh, <laughs> from Amazon. <laughs> so... Uh, and uh, I have uh, artificial intelligence in every room in my home. In this room, I have two lots, and I just let it loose. <clears throat> and there's a good reason. If you don't have any, if you don't have it, you can't say anything about it. If you do have it, you will learn something uh, about it for sure, and you can vo voice a, a valid opinion. So the upside to this AI is absolutely phenomenal it saves me typing slowly i can ask any question i want i can get forecast i can get data um but it has thrown me into a couple of uh, um embarrassing situations and I'll, I'll give you one my uh, uh, my fitness trainer and my wife were berating me because of the vast amount of coffee i drink 
you know, they, and it's bad for me, apparently. The fact that they drink bottles and bottles of wine uh, is okay. Anyway, during this conversation, I was really losing very badly, and the uh, AI system kicked in. Oh, Peter, I notice you've not had any coffee recently. Would you like me to buy some more? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. uh, Peter, so, can I come in there? Because um, Raoul is, Raul is keen to join in, I think. Uh, he's, he's waving his hand at me. So, yeah, Raoul, sure. I'm yeah. waving my hand. Thank you, Peter, for what, what you offered to us. I'm a little bit uh, surprised to see that you put so much emphasis in artificial intelligence and uh, you appear not to make a connection between that and what I was talking about earlier. Because that's it. Yeah. I, 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 I observe the same. And, and my problem is I can't yet. Uh, well, I'm, I, the, point, the point is that you have to hear me first and then you can start thinking. But I, I did, I did uh, mention the idea of uh, uh, enterprises uh, which uh, would grow to handle problem situations. You are very much dealing with the problem situation. And this problem situation is one that uh, requires not only little machines that come from the Far East, but they require of a whole range of organizations, of units that are distributed throughout the world. And unless you bring them together and you help them to think more purposefully, and more clearly about the problems and the situations that you are uh, describing, then we are going to be left with I, what I consider is one of the great limitations of uh, the use of artificial intelligence today. And that is not to merge in artificial intelligence with organizational aspects. And the organizational aspects I've been uh, putting together now and offered to you is organizations not of an individual enterprise, but of networks of enterprises. And in, 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 a, in a way, they are connected to the generation of content. They are going to the, the problem of building up some kind of collaboration and tool. And that's what I would be interested to hear that uh, you make the connection in one way or the other so that uh, we uh, somehow uh, see how organization and artificial intelligence come together. Okay, you know, a couple of things. Um, you, um, you, know, you put up the vast complexity afforded by two to the 256. Um, what I'm looking at is uh, a world of N, which is a big number, not two, a big number, raised to the power of 7 billion. And what I'm talking about is the state of these. Now you throw in the IOT, which takes that 7 billion up to a potential 250 billion. And we have got not just a society of people, we've got a society of things that we're trying to cope with. So um, I watch, I mean, I've been in industry all my life. My transition to academia has been fairly uh, recent. Uh, I have watched and I've been a part of uh, companies that have uh, struggled because human beings could not uh, rationally analyze the situation. And um, I'm not suggesting for one moment uh, that uh, we won't uh, bring people and machines together to best advantage. That's exactly what we must do. But um, we are facing situations where we do not stand the hope in hell of understanding uh, all the basic states, let alone uh, the combin. It is combinatorially massive, but it's also stochastic. It is changing very, very quickly. Uh, the economic model um, that people are uh, uh, touting uh, is, is just um, not going to work. I mean, it's obvious to a blind man uh, that you can't manage this planet on the basis of a dollar. You need to have at least um, the impact of what you do has got to be accounted for in terms of the ecology 
and it has got to be accounted for in terms of the impact uh, on societies. And none of that is done at the moment. So even uh, you know what we our foundation uh, money um, that doesn't work, and we we uh, it, it's going to be it's always very difficult to move from an established system and we've got an established system going back hundreds of years uh, to something entirely new. Um, inside companies, uh, what has actually happened? Uh, let me just explain this quite clearly to you. Academics, doctors, surgeons, um, engineers, scientists have abdicated responsibility to an uneducated class of uh, people with MBAs, if you like, who believe that they know the truth and they're making all the wise decisions. Oh, is I'm so sorry, Peter. I, I really think you, you, you have a, a very technocratic view of all this. I, I, really, the, the issue when I started with the two to the power of 256 was to show you how simplistic is the way we approach problems. Because if anything like that is able to over, over, overflow us, is simply the fact that we have far more complexity than that we can handle with simple black boxes. And what the point is, in my view, is that the complexity being so large is posing problems to us and that and these problems are problems of reducing variety, which is what I showed there. And at the same time, there is a problem of uh, uh, amplifying variety, and that is to increase the capacity to make things happen when uh, the situation is, uh, is, is going beyond us. And this is what we call variety engineering. And in variety engineering, is when you can make the connections that you are, you are not seeing because you are giving too much emphasis to the technology and not enough to the connection of people to organizations. And that is perhaps one of the issues that I would love to see that is built up and that we make more connections between our technologies, which are wonderful and beautiful, but our people. And the fact that people there are reflecting their views and expressions in the uneducated fashion is something that I believe is, is very desirable because that's the way in the end that you are going to overcome very big problems. So do you think, if I, if, I can, if I can cut in, um, do you think um, the political thing, big P or little P, I'm not entirely sure at, the, at this particular point in, in, in the conversation, um, you know, uh, global politics is, a, is an extremely complex organisation um, and um, what's underpinning its activity at the moment, and certainly enabling a lot of activity at the moment is you know, the transition from 3G to 4G to 5G. And, uh, and my knowledge from, from, from my professional work is that um, you know, uh, the police are struggling with 2.5G. Um, the state is probably struggling, struggling with, with 3G. Um, and yet the world of, of, um, of, of nasty people is, is creeping towards the five. So, so the technology is enabling a set of behaviors which the political systems are not yet coping with and, and possibly as they stand, have no possibility of coping. Can I give you? Can, can I give you? Can, you, unlock that? can I give you one observation, John? Um, Mother Nature does none of this hierarchy. Does no organisation whatsoever, and she's incredibly resilient and unbelievably successful. We are running uh, increasingly towards uh, a biological model for our society uh, that is principally driven uh, by technology. Um, and um, the reason that uh, we don't have a lot of choice is that uh, you pull the technology where we are now, people die. If you are going to feed people, you have to have automated farming. I mean, I'm living in farming country here. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the guy in the cab of uh, the combine 
sits there watching the machine as the machine does all the driving. And um, the, the way in which all our production now is organized puts us critically dependent upon uh, machines. Uh, there's no going back unless you say, well, we, we, we better see off five billion people because um, you've only got to go back a hundred years uh, and say how many people were uh, on the planet. Uh, and could you go back to that time? I don't think so. The, no, our best bet is to be able to stabilize the situation. Sorry? I wrote in my PhD in 1993, that's what, nearly 30 years ago, of the potential for a reversion to a fundamental subsistence economy. And that was rooted in, in, in you know, our failure then to apply the ideas that Raoul is, is talking yeah. about. What would happen, um, gentlemen, if we synthesize the, the organizational thing here, human beings will create, will create organizations um, if, for no other reason than to exercise power over each other. Uh, if we took the thinking that informed the, the VSN and underpinned it with a really deep understanding of what we could do beneficially with the technologies we've, we've created, what would we, what would, have, could we synthesize something out of that realm? Would that be a, a positive way of working? I think that's happening to some extent. You know, if you ever look at the medical profession, especially AI rules, it, it is able to diagnose. Uh, Ailments better than so, they do. I mean, well, so, I mean, my problem with AI in that sense is, is and in medicine as, as an example, is it's only doing the trivial stuff. It's not it doing the complex, it's not doing the complex stuff. And that's where I'm, I'm interested because the, the human interaction that runs an organization, however ineptly, how can that capitalize <coughs> on the power of that technology in the same way we do for operational that's stuff? Exactly, oh. that, that's exactly what we need to do through the enterprise complexity model. Because what we have, I'm not uh, suggesting anyone to run the business uh, on its own. I'm suggesting how is it possible that we connect the people starting from the very bottom, starting from those who appear to be unknowledgeable and go all the way to support the creation of policies and transform the politics into something that can handle very complex situations and reduce the risks of situations like uh, uh, Peter was uh, showing with, with the Russians. I think in, in a way we have to move ahead, away beyond the technology it's on, in its own. We need to increase the, the braving of technology and organization in practice and not just as general statements of intention. And that's what uh, I think the, ent the enterprise complexity model is offering as a tool. Thanks, Raul. So, um, Herard Vizu, you were, you've just put a nice comment in the um, in the chat. Would you like to, to say it out loud and, and, and we'll move the debate somewhere else? You're on mute. <laughs> We're still not hearing you. It should should be bottom left bottom left on your panel. It should be a microphone you can you can debar. We're not hearing we're not hearing anything. Um, Abdul, you're sitting there looking thoughtful while while Herard suits himself out. Have you got a as, as the as the, the young one of the younger people in the room? You got some thoughts on this? It's your future. You're on mute too. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that I might, I might be the, one of the younger ones. Um, I think I, I can, the really interesting argument. So, you know, technocratic thinking is all well and good, but it gets politicized. Um, um, and then Raoul's points around people, you know, they're a big part of the system. So I think there is a synthesis. I'm not sure exactly what it is, but there definitely is, it is in, um, is, is a synthesis. I think um, one thing perhaps uh, I might say on AI, and I'm no expert, is um, AI is, you know, he, human as human intelligence and artificial intelligence might be quite different things. I, I think intelligence is not as objectively defined as we might think it is. Um, and um, I don't think we're anywhere near what we think AI should be. I mean, there's, there's machine learning and there's um, kind of um, um, and that's quite different from what AI could and should be. So whilst we're making 
fast progress in terms of deep learning and machine learning that isn't ai it's it's, it's a much bigger thing so it's worth tempering um, what we mean by ai as well that's probably in my, in my lifetime in my lifetime that exact argument was put for computing computing is not general purpose okay so ai is not general purpose but it soon will be because that's where it's going. And it might be in the interim, we have to glue a load of AIs together to get uh, what, we, what we need to do. But you know, it's, uh, it would be a, a really big mistake to think that uh, we can live without it because uh, we can't. Um, the human brain is so limited. And so live without it, Peter, no one. What is important is to take the two things together, to at least and the organization and AI and technology together can enhance. And that's what, what cybernetics can contribute at this moment. Yep, I, I, and, I, and I'm gonna leave that to, to you guys because I've got enough on my plate trying to, uh, <laughs> technology to uh, behave itself. Gerard, is your precisely, microphone working now? The, precisely the point is when, when you say my plate is full, and in fact, what we are, the reason you don't get support to, to continue with your research is perhaps because the political aspects attached to that are not enough considered. Um, it's actually more to do with the ignorance of the audience. Well, <laughs> it's a very arrogant. We all, we all have that problem. Position, the one that you have. Gerard, is your, is your microphone working now? I hope so. That's yes. Why. That's yes. Good. Uh, I wanted to raise a question because I remember the movie Red October very well, but not because I was thinking about the difficulties for decision makers, but because I was thinking about the abilities of strategic thinkers. Now, Remius is clearly a strategic thinker. He is able to realize his objective, which is defection, uh, in the context of a very, very complex situation. Um, one of the things that he is doing is to withhold information to some people and give information to other people and so on and so on. So uh, if other people would do the same, I think you might argue that by using a different type of model than decision making, you actually might be able to find solutions to singular complex problems, but you have to realize that you cannot change the whole system, which Remius is not doing. What would, what would you say to that? Well, uh, let me just point out that I use that dramatization, uh, which is a huge simplification of the world that I'm working in. Uh, that, that situation falls into insignificance compared to the, the cyber situation, which is billions of times more complex. Now, if, if I roll in here uh, and start putting up the, uh, the, the diagrams and the mathematics, it becomes indecipherable. Uh, and, it, and, it, and what I'm trying to do is raise awareness and, and paint a picture. So what you have to imagine now is, um, you know, you've not got a Ramius, you, you've got 7 billion of them, and they've all got a purpose. So to put, put things bluntly, um, if my laptop was taken away, I, like a lot of other scientists and engineers, will be rendered pretty useless. Uh, let me give you a shocking revelation. Uh, I've not read a book for 10 years. I will not read another book as long as I live. And the reason is, the time any, any book actually hits the bookstores or hits a shelf, it's already out of date. That's not where the leading edge is anymore. So we, we've got, I, I'm pushing the boundary purposely. That's always been my job. And I'm experimenting. And I, I, I can't actually say anything about the situation unless I'm actually living it. And so um, I have gone uh, over a 60 year period from being able to read every single paper published on the topic that I was working in to all of a sudden having to have a group read it and if anybody found anything useful we would uh, converse to the point where like a lot of medics um, if i was reading uh, the research papers on the topic i'm now working in and i did nothing else 24 hours a day and i never slept and and, and while i was eating i was reading 
after a, a year of doing this, I'd still be a couple of years behind. That's the damn challenge, you know, and this, this is a, a, a new problem area. Now, this is not to say that um, all the material uh, is first class. In fact, one of the big problems is the ease of which people can publicate, publish things means that we need some kind of filter to sort through and find the really good stuff. And at the moment, I'm using a human network and AI at the same time to try and help me do that. And, th and these are today, these are today challenges. This is the kind of uh, problem we face. So I can bring it, in Raul then, Peter, for a response to that as well, and then go to Paolo. So Raul, any comments on, on Gerard's question? Sure. Well, no, I, I think uh, I do have a, a number of comments about Peter Cochran, but I suspect that we are coming from so different realms. I, I, I think that uh, clearly uh, there are new ideas, new insights that are coming all the time. And once we take the decision not to read anymore, we are essentially uh, removing ourselves from the reflection and the capacity of creativity that society has to offer to us. So uh, the, I, I, I go back, unfortunately, Peter, to seeing that the, the opposition is very technocratic and that uh, society and poli politics are aspects that we need to bring together with what you're doing. And that, in my view, is really a most extraordinary and important challenge. That's what, that's why I've got a PhD student that uh, is ace in- Sorry, school. I'm sorry. It's you the one who has to give the, the, the lead in this. Okay, uh, let's, see what, let's get a view from, from, from Paolo. Um, uh, so Paolo, do you want to come in? Uh, thank you, John. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. We can. Um, hi. Thank you very much, Raul. Thank you, uh, Peter, for the two amazing presentations. Um, I just wanted to take a bit of time to uh, relate my happiness. Um, of, of coming from the fact that Peter used fiction to um, do his presentation. Uh, he used uh, movies. Um, and I think this is really interesting because me being, uh, you know, a child in, in cybernetics, uh, a very young student of cybernetics, the more I learn, the more I cannot help myself uh, recognizing not just cybernetic principles, but also AI principles in the fiction that I consume and even in real life. Now I can't help seeing a movie like... Uh, I don't know, the, the latest one with, uh, with Daniel Day-Lewis, the Phantom Thread, and not recognizing there a system with several loops and the, um, the end of the movie, uh, the, you know, the, the punchline is an intervention that works in a particular way that is striking. And I think that has immense uh, didactic, didactic um, educational power. So well done, Peter, thank you. Okay. I I, I appreciate that. Let me, I, I'd like to make my situation position really clear. Um, I do not apologize for being a technocrat, uh, not at all, uh, because I think I can bring to the party uh, something that other people don't understand and can't see. My big problem has always been clear communication. So I arrived here <laughs> at a, uh, a point using a movie, uh, having given uh, thousands of lectures uh, and presentations and um, I have sometimes with my students uh, a graph that I use, and it's, it's what I call the lie curve. So it's an exponentially going down curve. And so I can uh, tell you the absolute truth, snag is you won't understand it, or I can tell you a lie and you'll get 100%. So I'm always riding on a line of uh, information that's partially correct, because what I want to do is communicate with the audience uh, and get them to react. If I'd have come here tonight and there'd have been no discussion, uh, or uh, if I'd have agreed 100% with Raoul, what a waste of time. Uh, the, point of, the point of these uh, events is to create sufficient um, uh, creative uh, tension, if you like, or contention 
that uh, everybody learns something. So, uh, and that includes me. I, I always learn something. So um, uh, that's my uh, sort of mild, mild defense uh, uh, on, on my position. Uh, I've spent my life trying to improve humanity's lot. Um, and that has been through technology. Uh, I'll give you one last provocative thought. If it wasn't for technology, we would know absolutely nothing, relatively speaking, period. And, and there's no debate about that. Everything we have discovered is through technology and the resource that we've got, which is dynamic, is online. Uh, it could never be put on paper. Uh, and that's where we are. Um, I'm happy about most of it. I'm not entirely about a lot of it, but um, that's the nature of uh, our world. Never perfect. So I, I work with, um, I'm currently working with a well-known um, rail infrastructure company who couldn't possibly name. Um, and, and what's disturbing in, in the whole of this conversation is that on the one hand, um, Peter, um, they can't even tell me what assets they've got and where they are. Um, and uh, on the other hand, Raoul, um, they can't tell me who's responsible for them and how they fix them when they when, when they go wrong. Uh, and I sort of uh, sit here you know, deeply worried, frankly, that on the one hand, uh, we couldn't organise our way out of a paper bag on, on a large scale organisation because we don't listen to the lessons of, of, of things like the VSM that, that inform us so well. Uh, and, and at the same time, we can't apply the technology, even, even at what we would all regard as relatively trivial level, um, to support the decision making in that, in that organisation. And yet every day, millions of people um, ride on trains on that network. And, and I think next time I can show I'll have my fingers crossed um, <laughs> that the whole thing knits together coherently. Um, it, it's sort of... Um, so you take the threat position, which is the you know, the bad actor from a foreign country wants to come along and, and impose a borscht and, and, and cabbage soup on our uh, on our British lifestyle, um, and we sort of you know, we, we we take that you know, if we accept that as an extreme case, and we we I think most of us would accept the threat is out there, um, uh, but actually on a much more mundane level, we can't cope with it anyway. Um, and we have to find a way of taking those 7 billion people, I think, um, and all their um, widgety artifacts um, and finding a way, of, as Raoul says, of, of, of allowing them to or creating the conditions under which they can enlighten themselves in order that they can start to address these problems. And we need to create, we do need to create structures in which that can happen, because I don't think they will evolve in nature. Uh, I think, I think you are giving a very nice example of the situation why we need to understand who to involve in the discussions and conversations that are relevant to the problems of that rail company. So the problem is not of some top brass people there. The problem is of bringing together as many people as relevant so that to, they, they create and generate options and possibilities in the situation that you are dealing with. If you just think about the very top and the, the people who are running hierarchically the organization, I think you don't get too far. And I suspect that that's what we are on the whole trying to sort out at this stage. I think, yes, uh, tragically, we certainly in this country at the moment, we have a, a tendency to use um, human beings um, only when we can't find a machine that will do their work for them. And consequently, we, we reduce the, the, the content of a job to uh, yeah, sort of monkey see, monkey do type um, repetitive activity. The thinking jobs we've, we've sort of kind of taken away, and that's a sort of disturbing characteristic um, of, of quite a lot of organisations. And in that, because um, I don't work in one, I will include our universities, um, which are you know, sort of um, credentialising machines uh, these days rather more than they are um, educating machines, which is which is sad. Now um, we've all so yeah, so Raoul, um, Peter, myself, um, Abdul for a little bit, and, and Gerard uh, have largely dominated this. There's an awful lot of people still here who haven't. I don't know whether you're all bored or asleep or you've been entertained, but are there any sort of comments from, from wider members of the, of the group? Make sure it's generally bloody chat, yeah.
I have. Uh, oh, sorry. Someone else. Was yeah, Richard first. Then you, Miguel. So I, I can make a comment about um, rail systems um, <laughs> and the complexity thereof. Um, and I've got my fit, my feet in the uh, in all three camps: people, process, and technology. So part of my job is sort of cognitive systems engineering and human factors engineering of rail systems and trying to fuse uh, the latest in um, machine learning um, and automated systems with uh, Victorian um, infrastructure um, and um, even older business practices. So um, I, I see what you see, John, most days. Most of our resilience actually is in the humans, not in the machines. Um, and our complex system is glued together by um, people um, at the sharp end making the right decisions based on um, uncertain and dynamic information. So you need, to, you can't take a technocratic or an organizational view. You've got to fuse them together. Um, the trick is to know how and when to do that. And then when you're looking at the next 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years, what do we need? What does it look like? And then how do we get there? Um, so we've got one foot in uh, in the in the past. Um, everyone's looking to the future and we're solving tomorrow's problems with, with, with today's best ideas and yesterday's technology. Uh, and it's very complicated. And we're just basically working in a, in a liminal space uh, most days where um, we don't quite know where we are or where we need to go. And then things like COVID hit and we realize that yes, we are, um, we've made lots of efficiencies and we're driving towards um, satisfying, not optimizing. Thanks, Richard. Um, yeah, I've forgotten, I've forgotten you've got your railway diagram sitting there behind you. Um, Miguel. Uh, yeah, so uh, I see this yawning gap uh, between Raul's domain and, and Peter's domain. So my question is, okay, well, who is working in the middle of that gap? I'm actually spanning all of it, but I'm doing it with the, the aid uh, of a team. And uh, here is the problem. Um, I, 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 the, the last doctorate I, I uh, got, I decided I would no longer be a specialist. And so I've had 20 years as a consultant, as a generalist. <laughs> and in doing that, I've, I've worked for organizations uh, like Facebook. And believe it or not, the issues I was dealing with there were largely uh, human factors as opposed to the, uh, the technology. And uh, the, the, the big problem is uh, in a lot of organizations, the people come along with an education that looks like a soda straw and they do their bit without any knowledge of the repercussions anywhere else. So I've been sort of bridging that gap in the oil industry, pharmaceuticals, uh, in retail, uh, right across the board. And um, the big challenge is never the technology, it's always the people. Raul. I think, I think uh, Miguel, the, the problem is who is in the middle is not, uh, I have tried to exp express myself in such a way that I see that this organization <coughs> is clearly uh, related to the technology and the great advances that have been produced by that. And so the, four, the, the point is not that I am in one extreme and Peter is in the other extreme. I think the problem in my view is that we need to find ways to bridge the gaps of people who think in such different ways. Mm -hmm. And that is, uh, is something that we can do by uh, communicating more clearly between us and accepting, you know, there are aspects in my thinking that I would be creating by understanding better people's thinking. And I hope that you will get some value out of that. Let me give, let me give you a ray of hope, Crow. Let me give you a ray of hope. I'm the first professor uh, in this university to walk across the road to the humanities department and say, uh, I want you to help me with the project. Because they, they, all, they, all, they, all, they, all live in, they all live in boxes and they don't come out of their box. 
Well, that's precisely what uh, systems thinking. I, uh, if you uh, 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 the original, uh, uh, original diagram, going to the fragmentation of life, which is the, exactly what that little box, like the fragmentation at the bottom, is what is destroying us as a human race, is destroying our possibilities for the future. So please try to avoid expressing in the in the real practice the fragmentation that I was showing as lack of systemic sensibility. So I'm going to come in here, um, everybody, because it's, it's very nearly time. Um, and my point in running these sessions is to get two interesting people in a room and see what happens. Um, I've been educated and entertained and amused and once or twice a little bit frightened during the course of the last couple of hours. And I, I will make no attempt to synthesize that into a single, single view of what happened. Um, what I would say is you know, the point of these things is to create precisely the sort of conversation we've had that, that creates the opportunities for bridges between people thinking about things in very, very different ways with actually, I, I sense a common humanity in the middle of it all, in truth. Um, you know, that the, we may be going to things from different angles, but I think we all have pretty much the same end in mind. And um, so can I please say thank you to, to Raoul and, and Peter for um, doing all, all the, the usual and keeping us going. Um, we will get this out onto um, YouTube as soon as possible so you can replay the highlights, um, which is always good. Um, and um, we're going to take next month off. There will not be a President's Series in August because um, I think we need a break. Um, so the next one of these will be in early September, but we'll be in contact to let you know uh, exactly what that's going to be all about. So in the meanwhile, I'll see some of you at the AGM on the 17th. I'll see some of you at the uh, Insights series, which I think is on the 27th, with Steve Battle talking about robo-psychology, so the psychology of robotization. So that should be a good one for you, Peter, maybe. Um, yep. uh, in the meanwhile, thank you all very much. Thanks again, Raoul and, and Peter. Thank you. Thanks thank for inviting you. me. Good night. Good night. Good night.